My name is Dick Lochan. I'm from that beautiful island of Trinidad and Tobago. I was actually born in South Trinidad in the city of San Fernando. At a very young age, I, I fell in love with all aspects of our culture, from the way the people spoke to um, the steel pan, Calypso, because I was around most of it where I lived in San Fernando. I could hear the pans. Um, I used to go to the tent. And my brother actually built a uh, big, beautiful mascot tune. And he was involved in the pan, steel pan as well. So everything was around me in the schools, in the community. I loved the way the people spoke. And I particularly paid uh, attention to that. I was schooled at San Fernando Government School. And that, from there, I went to St. Benedict's College in La Romaine, which is still in San Fernando. And again, I was further introduced to all aspects of our culture. Um, we are from a cosmopolitan island, so everything was around me, in pub, both in public school and in high school. Um, so that's really where I first acquired the taste for our culture, you know. I... Um, I vividly recall um, mimicking people, how they spoke, um, paying particular attention to accents and to how they say things. Though I was schooled under the British system, you know, we had all these um, these things growing up. You know, in school we had to speak properly, and yet outside you would um, be hearing the dialect. You know. And um, so we were bombarded with that, and that's how all of it fell into place. Um, it's language. I always liked languages. And um, so from a very early age, I was um, intrigued by the Calypso, and I used to go to the Calypso tent. Uh, we had one in San Fernando, the Southern Brigade, and here the old bards, how they delivered these Calypsos. It's storytelling, really. So the stories intrigued me, how they put it together with the music and the proper songs on the radio we would be, that was the music of Trinidad and Tobago in that era. So you're being exposed with it all along. We as little boys coming back from the tents, we used to be singing these songs on the way home because they had nice catchy melodies. Uh, we could remember the lyrics and so on. Well, one of the early calypsos that uh, really intrigued me, and I still sing it in my repertoire, is it was a song called Spread Joy. An old lady husband died, up to now she a cry. The man leave she plenty money, big car, house and property. I thought that she will feel sad, but this old woman was glad. In the wake she winked she eye and whispered to me as I passed by, Come with me, let we go and spread joy. I'm in love with you, Dicky boy. Just tell me that you love me and I would make you happy. So come with me, let we go and spread joy. And that was a beautiful song. I mean, when you started to write out the words, and this was a song that I sang at a, our school concert. And in those days, you had to audition, of course, and uh, the act had to be picked because you were in front of the whole school. So that was my first uh, um, adventure into Calypso, and I vividly recall doing that particular number, the whole thing. I came to Canada straight out of high school in 1966. But I should say that during that time, I used to be writing stories, poetry, and uh, little skits and so on in dialect. But I had to hide it from my parents because they didn't want us. We couldn't speak that way. You know, we went to British schools with all proper grammar and proper English. Um, as I mentioned, we were under the British system. In high school, the same thing. So how could I really pull these things out and show those things to my parents? However, I continued writing and I kept my books and my scrapbooks and so on hidden. So when I came to Canada, I, had to, I came with some of these things. I remember writing a dialect story about coming to Canada. 
and vividly recalling how we were dressed and, you know, waiting on the BWI, the plane to come in and so on and having all those things in my files, you know. I went, set about typing them up because in those days we were the old typewriters. I was a two-finger uh, typewriter uh, typist and I typed up some of these things and still had them in a folder. Um, again, the love for language was very deep. I majored in English at York. Um, I had a love for, for uh, languages in high school, English, Latin, Spanish, French. Even in Trinidad, I had won books and so on for those things. So language was a big part of my, and it still is a big part of my, um, my life. I like to read. I like to write still. Calypso is again. Um, it's all language. Um, you know, and then the dialect is our language. We have a language of our own. I know some of us deny that, but we do. And um, it's a street language as any other of the islands or any, even in Canada, they have a street lingo that, you know, you talk the Americans and so on. So we are fully aware of that. Now, the Calypso is written in the vernacular, which is the dialect. Okay, and again, I, I just want to say something about the dialect. All of the dialects, and in particularly the dialect of Trinidad and Tobago, is English-based, right? We would say, hi, how are you? Down in Trinidad, what's happening there? What's happening? If I were to write that on a board, you will see where the roots come out of. You know, and it's the same with the other islands too. They're all English, Caribbean English islands, but they all have their dialect. It's the very way we speak. You know, um, we will, uh, we have expressions, again, as I said, um, uh, they, they, when they say what happening, they, it's really what's happening, it's, it's a short form. We say hi, it's a greeting, you know, um, how you're going, man, you hear, how you doing, you hear all those things, you know. Um, we also have, uh, but when we write it, writing the dialect, now it's another, it's another aspect of it. Um, but, you know, we speak it in, in the way just as, you know, street, but it's coming out of school. So we will go home, like, for example, in, 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 when we went to go to the bathroom in school, we would say, Miss Permission, please, I'd like to go to the bathroom. But when we reach home now, Mommy, I want to pee. You know, it's this type of things you're hearing out there. You hear people shout at the screen. When you get a Caribbean person or Trinidadian mad, you really hear when the dialect comes out, you know. You, you, you disturb your mother or something and she picks up a pot spoon and says, but you let me hit you. You will always hear those kinds of things come out. So it's always there and sometimes we get in little corners and you hear us. But if you pay attention to it, it's again, as I said, it's English driven. How that translated into the Calypsos? Because remember, the Calypsonian is the storyteller, is the eyes and ears of that community. So it's first started, when you go look back at the history of Calypso, in those days you had Calypsos in fine English. If you went back to the 40s and 50s, because we, you know, we studied Shakespeare and we studied all the greats. And if you looked at people like the Roaring Lion and Attila the Hun and so on, they were singing some of those things in English. They sang, one, like for example, Roaring Lion has sang for the Queen. And, you know, they went touring and so on, and there was a lot of that English thing. Now, remember, we also had uh, various influences in Trinidad. So we had the French influence, so we had some patois, which is a broken kind of French that they sang into. Some of those songs are in patois. We've had the Spanish influence, so some of those things get into our words and our language and, of course, our native things. So it started to get... So from that English and the Patois and the French, it started to grow. It grew into our dialect, which is our language of, 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 of street language and our language that we commonly speak. And that's how it got into the Calypso. And the Calypsos, because it's like a good Calypso today, if I were to write a Calypso today and sing it in proper English, uh, Trinidadians uh, and Tobagonians may laugh at me, you know, because, you, you know, it's like a... It's like a Canadian singing a calypso, and we do have those things when we laugh. So it lends itself to, to capture the feel and the, the people uh, that the dialect, we use the language of the street, we live, use the language of the people, and that's how the dialect came into being into, into the calypso, you know. So, um, and it's grown, 
Um, again, the double meaning comes back from the history, from, from language itself, because when we sing, we try to hide it, so a calypso would have two meanings. And it's, it's, you know, so people will take it one way and then the other way the language, because again, it's a language twist. I am known in the Calypso world as the Jews man. Now, I took the fact that we have all over the world of people juicing. Everybody's into fitness, they're into health and fitness, so they're juicing. So I created a story around this. I, you know, I, this is really rampant. Everybody's juicing. They're telling me it's on the street, everything. So I took that whole concept of the Jew thing and sang a calypso about the Jews man. But the way I twisted my my girlfriend, I created a story of my woman or my girlfriend. Uh, she likes to juice too, and she's into health and fitness. But she doesn't want anybody else's juice or the juice from the cans. She wants the natural juice. So it says, uh, "Give me the juice, baby. Is what does keep me healthy." Give me the juice, baby, is what does keep me healthy. I don't like it from the can. You is my natural juice, man. So, you know, she wanted me to make her juice and so on. So you see the two meanings, you know, and this is an attractive uh, woman, you know, my girlfriend that the, the story creates, a fictional story, and people can relate to that. And, of course, when I sing that song, I come out with the carrots and the, you know, the cake run and like a, a juicer, you know, like a, the, the, the attire that I would wear in the kitchen in cre making some of the, this juice. So the whole story now is um, played out and people will get that because my audience in Canada now, they're all, it's, uh, it's all here, everybody's juicing and they get the story. So I sing for universal appeal and for a broader audience. And again, if it's a story, I want everybody to get my story. Double entendre in Calypso is, um, it's two meanings, as I said. Um, uh, you know, because, for example, that same Calypso, if I were to go back to a Jew thing, you, you're walking on a, on a wire, on a, on a line, as I say. You walk, The double meaning is like this. It has one meaning here and one meaning here. Now, it's a clean song. Somebody could come to me, and I've done interviews where they would say, Dick, that song is, uh, you will see the health and, health and fitness aspect of juicing. And others will be laughing because they're seeing it, the, the sexual and the, and, and that, that connotation there with the girl, with my, the girlfriend and the type of juice she wants from me. So you see, it has that kind of thing. But, you know, I, the way you sing it with the language, it has that double, uh, and then again, the whole, thing of the dance and the body language and the, and the big carrots that I use, you know, it's all playing to that type of thing. But, again, it's so, it's so double, it's, that's double entendre as its best because they can't accuse you of going either way. And there were several calypsos like that. Um, I sang a calypso about the hot dog vendor. I mean, you know, hot dog vendors are big, you know, they're selling all kinds of things. But, I made it out. I am now the hot dog vendor, and these women, women want to taste my hot dog. Now, and again, here in North America, we have hot dogs of different sizes. So, we have the 6-inch, we have the 9-inch, we have the 12-inch. I know, as a fact, now in Texas, they have a 24-inch. And so, I'm singing about these women are waiting on me, coming to my cart, my hot dog cart, to get their hot dogs. But... Hot dogs have the one meaning of the way they're lining up to come for a quick lunch. I worked downtown in the hub and I saw the popularity of the different hot dogs. And then we have the hot dogs with women wanting uh, the juice man because my real name also is Dick. So there's another play on um, double meaning there and uh, with the hot dogs. So you'll see that kind of um, connotation to, you know, womanizing and all the stuff, you know, um, and people get it, they get it. In Toronto here and in Canada, you mix with a lot of people. Um, dub poets, I'm introduced to dub poets, poetry, poetry with drumming. I always like culture, so every weekend I would be into some aspect of looking on to see what's going on and that. And then I thought the time was right to introduce my first book of dialect, Don't Make Joke. And the reason for that, it was called Don't Make Joke, it was to share my Caribbean culture with Canadians. Remember, we were in a multicultural society, and even the dialect. I want to demystify 
our dialect for non-Trinidadians and Tobagoonians. And that's what I set out to do. So I had a lot of funny stuff in that book. And again, it's humor. Um, I showed them. I did it. I wrote for a wide cross-section the dialect. So even a little child in a school could come and read that dialect. Because dialect, it's a phonetic sound. Again, I told you, it's English-based. So if they sound out the word, they will get the word. And at the back of each of my books, I had a glossary of the terms and what they meant. So I would go to the school, and um, if once a child could read, I'd call up a Canadian child and come, and they'll come and read the dialect. And the kids would be laughing because it would be hilarious. Here it is, I'm introducing dialect to them. A Canadian child is reading dialect because I'm there to point it to them and tell them to sound it out, giving them tips and pointers. And they're all having a ball. Everybody's laughing. They're putting up their hands to come up and read with me. And there's some funny stuff, you know, basic stuff. But I did that at an introductory level so it could cross-section. Like I did a lot of public schools. I did a lot of high schools. I even have done universities. The library started calling me. Um, and it started to take off. Um, I was also called into the literacy circle because there's a lot of Caribbean adults from the Caribbean who can't read and write, people who can't read and write, and they might be very versed in their dialect. Uh, now with me, I can demystify that for teachers, how to deal with them, and I spent about four or five years in, in literacy as well. Okay, I went on to write three books, two more books of dialect, and again, I always like to put a variety of stuff. I have poems, I have skits, I have short stories, I have a glossary with the English term, with the, uh, the dialect and the, what it means, so that any reader, they were very popular, I could tell you, my first book, I got reviews in Jamaica, in Trinidad and Tobago, it sold out here very quickly. It's fun, people, when I go into school and we do a reading and I bring anybody up an adult, even now, People, are, it, it, it breaks them down because they're reading it. And I particularly bring in a non-Trinidadian uh, to, to assist with me to demonstrate how beautiful that dialect is. Uh, we ended up doing a book for the, um, for the Board of Education on uh, English, uh, the English language for adult learners with English and dialect. And I was very happy to be among such people as Miss Lou, Paul Keynes Douglas, and they picked for four of my stories. Some of my stories were also used in a, in, in a book, in an anthology in the States, uh, of how we speak and the dialect and so on. Um, I started a lot of cultural work, I should say, down at the Caribbean Catholic Center. That was the hub of, um, I would say, Caribbean culture in those early days down there. They had a lot of plays, skits, uh, they did a lot of shows and so on. So I was, I was down there. I actually introduced a dialect column in the church's uh, magazine uh, very, very early down there. And people in church, I used to laugh, and as they come out of church, they would look for my column. Uh, it was called Dempsey, and they would, you'd see people coming out of church, standing there, just turning to that page and laughing. And it was little tidbits that I overheard from the congregation people downstairs and so on, and they would be laughing. It got popular. I started to do plays. I went in to do plays at the Caribbean Catholic Church. We would do Christmas plays, and they wanted a Caribbean team. They wanted skits for different variety shows. I was the person they were calling on. So I've come through the ranks with a lot of those things, and, you know, of course, I ended up emceeing shows, you know, because they wanted a true Caribbean um, MC. And, um, you know, as they say, I got into the the, um, the emceeing, I did a lot of work, um, all kinds of shows, uh, young, old, anywhere they wanted, where they wanted a natural person, you do have to be able to switch uh, to that, but, and then there is those ones you go to where they don't want a dialect, people, even your own Caribbean people, they don't, they feel you're talking bad, you know, we can't, Dick, you can't come here and talk all that thing, you know. So you have to talk properly, this is St. Joseph's Convent and so on, you know. We still have some of that in some of these things, but we also have to be proud of our language and so on. So I love it. I continue to do it. And again, emceeing took me all over. And um, it eventually, well, then the Calypso, I got involved in the Calypso through the emceeing. So I started into emceeing in the tent and the semifinals and the finals and so on and being around it and so on. 
And then from there is where I got into the Calypso. Um, I was writing all the time. Remember, I had all that history of culture and so on. But I really got into the Calypso from MC. As a matter of fact, I should say, even today, and I don't know if they check the records, they will see that. Um, I do double duties in those tents. I MC and sing even up to today. And if I look back at how far back I was doing that, I don't know if there is another current MC that MCs and sings um, as long as I have done it. So I do that because the Calypsonians want me to MC. They love it. And then the patrons want to hear my Calypsos. So it's a tough thing. I have to wear two hats. Um, I know the, the culture of competition. So I try in my very first year in, in Toronto, I got straight into the finals. Now, mind you, um, I went into the finals. I won best presentation. I believe I came eight in the finals and so on. I found it was kind of limiting I, um, because I'm an artist that grows and expands and, you know, it, it's kind of limiting in a way of your, your field of work because, oh, because I, I want to say this. I started one of the first Calypso tent here that people don't know. A tent was called Kilkitty. And I, right after the Calypso season stopped, I wanted to do Calypso shows year-round. So that was my headspace even then. I said, why are we only doing it here for Caribana? And I, formed, I pulled some good artists together, and we went and we did show Roving Calypso Tent. Kelkite Roving Calypso Tent. And I was doing shows that cut it out of the season. And I was taking it to new audiences and emceeing and singing. I had a nice little cast. And the people were doing that. And I always feel that my culture should be year wrong. I have a problem with the seasonality of it, even to this day. And that's why now I do it full time. I do it, I am a seven days a week, 365 uh, day man. Um, so, and also with competition, I, as you learn and grow, you notice the narrowness of the competition. So my headspace was seeing all of that very early because I, w I even did some research on looking at the type of songs that win and see the topics they sing on, local politics and, the, and, and seeing the limitations. So I'm making, I'm making a, a thing of the limitation of that in terms of the kind of songs that win the crown and so on. And if I am based here in Canada and Toronto and my, my, my audience is a multicultural audience, I have to, my compositions have to reflect so that all came out of growth. But anyways, coming back to the accomplishment, so I went to the finals. I won best presentation. Um, my biggest achievement in Calypso has been in the homeland, Trinidad and Tobago, and that was last year, 2014, when I made it through in Trinidad and Tobago to the National Calypso Humor Monarch Finals. Now, people audition from Tobago, all Trinidad, all across Trinidad and Tobago. They picked 32 singers for the semifinals. Um, I was in that semifinals, and from that 32, they picked eight. And I was in that, I was honored to be in the eight. Now, eight plus the monarch was nine. So it was on the grandstand stage, the big yard, as they call it, Queen's Park Savannah, the ultimate for any Calypsonian. Uh, from Trinidad and Tobago to perform in Queen's Park, Savannah. I did it. I was there. I've experienced it with humor. Two of my original compositions, because one of the things is you sang one of your original songs, and I could have done a vintage, but I chose instead to do one of my other songs. Uh, so that was the biggest. Uh, uh, also in Trinidad and Tobago, I sang in the central Trinidad, Coover competition, and out of 15 Calypsonians that were picked, I was the first runner-up. Now, people said how, you know, because you get the other thing about when you're from outside, you're from foreign, you know, they'll talk that this guy isn't from here. Although I'm Trinidad, yeah, and, um, you still get that kind of thing because I live here and I make no bones about it. And even it's a big feat in itself to journey down there and be singing in a Calypso tent and accomplishing those kinds of things because you have to deal with all that's there in the land of Calypso and um, make your mark. And what does that for you is the strength of your composition, your, your stage presence, your performance, 
and let the, the people decide. So that's been my, um, you know, every year I try to be consistent. Um, I have a lot of calypsos. I have three CDs now to my credit. They've done all well. The Juice Man sold out. I'm always uh, selling these things at shows. Um, people give me feedback. I'm open to criticism. I'm open to any kind of feedback. Children, adults, uh, non-West Indians, I listen to it all. I've had another successful CD, Unleashed. And in Unleashed, I try to show them my thing. I, I'm not boxed in. I, in Calypso, I, I, I cover the whole, all aspects of our Calypso genre. From Rapso to uh, sweet music, pan songs, uh, commentaries, historical songs. I've even done a chutney soca. It's not on that song. A groovy soca. A little, I'm taking right now a tush in the um, hot soca. Uh, but I'm noted for humor. Calypso has many genres. And you know, Calypso, I have to explain this a lot to people. Calypso is like the, is the mother of the culture. That's where it all started, Calypso. And Calypso has many children. It's a simplified way. So we have, you have Parang Soka now at Christmas. You have Chutney Soka with the Calypso uh, influence. Rapso, Rap and Calypso has come into Rapso. You have Pan Kaiso, a song that is written for the pan with Calypso and nice melodies and chord structures and so on. You, we used to have Raga Soka. Some people still sing in that thing. We have Gospel Lipso. You do a gospel with a Calypso uh, music and feel and so on. Um, what else do you have? So these are all children branches of the mother. And um, you, then you have now Power Soka, which is a very fast Soka. And you have the groovy Soka, the nice grooves in the Soka and so on. So, you know, and again, music doesn't stay stagnant. It's always changing, you know. Um, so, and this is what it is. And um, to demonstrate some of this stuff to you, um, uh, Rapso it could be a, like a poem with a, with a rhythm behind it. I am Calypso. I am Pan. Even Shango are telling your man. I am Rapso. I am Parang. You should know is my tradition. Check it out and you'll understand what it means to be trendy. You hear the music and I only chant in the words. Now, if you hear little drums and a guitar and a jazz man with a beat, you'll understand. So, Rapso puts the musical element in with that because um, our language, as a Calypsonian, as a Rapso and a poet, we have our language it has a musicality to it. And we know it because we have that A for that type of thing, you see. Now let me see if I could demonstrate another song for you, um, a, a little um, thing that I've done with the kid. Um, Teach me my culture. And this is a conscious type of song. Um, Everyone is a teacher in their special way. Even little children can teach us today. We can all, we can learn from all, all each other and live in harmony and make this world much better for you and you and me. Teach me my culture, teacher. Teach my history. You'll understand me better if you learn about me. Respect and honor, teacher. Please hear my plea. And teach me my culture, teacher. Teach my history. No, that was one of my first songs that I wrote. And I'll tell you, it's true reading and following what's happening in the school system. It's still relevant today because if we teach about each other's cultures and history, we'd be better off. Maybe we wouldn't even have wars. Because again, Toronto being the melting pot that it is, a lot of these things happen because people don't understand each other's culture the history, and so on and so on. So, here is that. Um, we did um, Calypso History. I have done uh, a song entitled Calypso History in Canada. And, you know, most people don't know the long history of Calypso here in Canada. So, I did a lot of research on this one, and I discovered that Calypso has been in Canada since in the 40s. You know, um, I'm in the association, and we started the association maybe 1981, the first Calypso Monarch, 1980. So we, you know, there's a lot of people that feel that that is where things 
started and so on. But digging back up into the history and going way beyond, it showed me that in the 40s it started. Most people don't know the history of Calypso in this country. They feel it started in 80 with the crowning of Lord Smokey. They never checked it seriously to know it was here since the 40s. First introduced to Canada by a trainee named Lord Caressa. To class in session, please pay attention and listen to this teacher, Calypso History in Canada. Now that song got a lot of plaudits to me. People, uh, academics were calling me and telling me, Dick, thanks very much for the research. Um, it's documentation um, of, of the Calypso history. It's paying respect to all those that went before us. Um, again, a Calypso only has four verses, so you have to pull things as a creator and um, mesh it into the thing. Um, and um, I got a lot of plaudits for that. Some people, serious people in, uh, in the fields of um, research and history and so on. Um, you know, and then we go back into the... Um, Sweet melodies. Now, I have noticed of late, well, I don't want to say of late, a lot of sweet melodies are lacking in Calypso. Um, you know, we're moving into that fast stuff. People who just listen to the radio and they go down for carnival and that, they're bombarded with these fast things. So there is no more. Uh, for the middle age and the older folk, they might be lost. They stand on the side. They can't go to those things. So I, I as an observer, as a Calypsonian, observe all these things. And I have to write. And you'll come and tell me, you know, stuff like that. Because remember, we are the eyes and ears. So here is this one that came up. Um, that thing too fast, glory I say. To shift we wrath and then go lay. We can't dance that. She tell me flat, give we something to do we thing. We still want to party and shake up we body. They give we little something so we could start dancing. Dance and chip, dance and chip, dance and chip. Swing your hip, dance and chip, dance and chip, dance and chip. Swing your hip. Come back out and dance with Gloria. Come back out and dance with Gloria. So there's the call and response. And it's only from a Calypsonian who knows the history and the things to use. That was the old days, call and response. So I call out to her, come back out and dance with Gloria. And they will be singing, come back out and dance with Gloria. And this is the story unfolding in front of me. And again, it has a sweet melody. That song won me an award here. Um, I won for uh, the best soca. Um, they had a soca thing. Again, it, 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 to me, it, it, you know, it's a good credit that the people voted. And these are People's Choice Awards. I won that with another chap, you know, because that year they gave it the uh, best soca and they had the people judge. This year, again, I should tell you, I won a People's Choice again with another, uh, my two songs. And as an MC and a singer, so those things just, you know, awards are part of good work. I don't, I am not a person to be hung up on awards and achievements and so on. I am a creator. I am, my head is down. I have my bag here. I am writing. I am researching. I'm trying to do quality work and improve myself. Every time I have high standards, I am my own worst critic. So when I hear from people, they, you know, this is why I can listen to anybody and that type of thing. But quality Brings hard, comes from some hard work, perseverance, and uh, willingness to improve. So I keep all of these things make me stronger, and uh, those things bring awards. They bring things with it, but it but you move on. <laughs> I play fast and married an old widow Who had a single daughter about 50 or so What get into me man, I really don't know 
But the old girl and she daughter was hot for so Now my father who's single and just lived by me Getting with the daughter and gone and married So now my father is my son-in-law And my stepdaughter is now my mother Oh my lad, oh, what a calamity I'm living in a mix-up family If my father did keep me till quiet I would have never ever end up in this jangjat My wife get pregnant and she make a son I telling you as man I feeling to run I believe at that age she could make children To mine a hole, me hole I was feeling to run Now my son is the brother of my stepdaughter And the brother-in-law of my father But this one had me totally confuffled I discover my son is now my uncle Oh my lad, what a calamity I'm living in a mix-up family If my father did keep me till quiet I would have never ever end up in this janjat My father wife now come and make a son too Well that one come and cause a big callaloo Really say we monkey see monkey do Is why them two make a boy child too Now my father son is my brother And is my grandson too partner And my wife who is my mother mother Rightfully is now my grandmother Oh my lad, oh, what a calamity I'm living in a mix-up family If my father did keep his skin quiet I would have never ever end up in this janjan Well, you know that I is my wife husband And at the same time is she own grandson Yes, me and the old girl does live as one And at the same time I is she self grandson And as the husband of my grandmother That makes me a true grandfather Sorry I could not make this any simpler But I end up being my own Grandfather, oh my lad, oh, what a calamity I'm living in a mix-up family If my father did keep me till quiet I would have never ever end up in this janjan